and welcome to today's prep talk, um, DEI, the call to task before you start the job presented by Dr. Cami Anderson. Um, Dr. Anderson received her PhD in intercultural communication from Howard University in Washington, DC in 2007. She received a BA in Spanish from Spelman College and an MA in international communication and cultural anthropology from American University. She has facilitated workshops around cultural sensitivity and intercultural learning for public and nonprofit se sectors for more than two decades. In 2017, she launched Bilingual Brown Babies, a specialized service for families of color who are serious about raising their children bilingual in English and Spanish. Dr. Anderson has published extensively in both English and Spanish in scholar and trade journals as well as in national U.S. news publications. Dr. Anderson has published several books, including From Sabotage to Support, A New Vision for Feminist Solidarity in the Workplace, co-authored by Dr. Joy Wiggins, uh, Raising Bilingual Brown Babies, Everyday Strategies to Become Confident, a Confident Bilingual Family, and Language, Identity, and Choice, Raising Bilingual Children in a Global Society. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Cami Anderson. Dr. Anderson, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Kristen. I appreciate the honor of being able to have this talk with you guys today. Um, I do know that we're short on time, so I just want to preface this with just a, just a blanket apology, because in haste, there might be places where I might inadvertently choose a word that might not necessarily be perfect for um for how we're trying to go through this conversation so if there's in any way that you are offended please charge my head and not my heart it is absolutely not my intention i do want to make sure that you are getting the best information and you are receiving the best and the, be the best of my heart in the midst of my sharing so i'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that we can get started. So we're talking about D-I-E, right? I added the A because I do think it's important for us to be able to acknowledge the access in the midst of all of this, right? So we're talking about the call to task before you start the job. And it can seem stressful to go into an interview with issues of equity and inclusion on the mind without even having a contract in hand, right? We begin to have self-talk and all these inner narratives that begin to cast doubt on whether or not we stand in principle or just get the job first. So we start to ask ourselves certain questions in our head. Questions like, what if asking these questions turns them off of me as a candidate? What if I offend them? Or what if the job seems like a dream except for this one little issue? Is it really that serious? Can I just let it slide until I get the job? So what we wanna talk about are, this overarching question is how do you successfully navigate concerns around diversity in the hiring process and what type of candidates should be asking these types of these types of questions to answer the second part first everybody can and should ask questions about diversity equity access and inclusion because it gives you a glimpse into the organization's culture institutional values and how the overall mission lines up with daily practices so today i want to give you 10 questions that you can add to your interview question pool you know you always have that moment where the search committee will say so do you have any questions for us these are some questions that you can be able to add to your question pool that can give you some insight into diversity equity access and inclusion at institutions now, I really love the dramatic nonverbal expressions found in the telenovela. You come to a scene, a question is asked, it may, that may reveal a secret, and usually what happens is you get an expression that looks kind of like this. And this one look gives you how the character feels about the question, if they want to answer the question, and whether or not the answer will even be true. Now, while the interview process may feel like a melodrama at times, the search committees are not going to be quite as obvious in their responses to your questions. But you can still look for signs and clues that will give you some insight into how they genuinely feel about the questions that you're asking around diversity, equity, access, and inclusion. So before we dig into the questions that I wanna give you today, let us consider three things that will assist you with how you're able to receive the responses to their questions. So the first thing is to take note of demeanor. 
what is the initial physical reaction of the room when you ask your question about diversity, equity, access, and inclusion? Take note of everyone in the room. So not just the person that might have said, so do you have any questions for us? Take note of the folks who did not say a whole lot. Take note of the people who might be observing. All of these questions, all of these observations are going to be necessary for you to really see, to get a feel for what is the overall initial physical reaction of folks when it comes to having conversations around these issues. Also look at their willingness. How quickly do they respond? Do they seem eager to give you an answer or hesitant? And being able to have that, that being able to track that is also gonna be important for you. Then I want you to look at content. What exactly do they say? Is it substantive? Is it a well thought out answer or a well rehearsed answer? And the difference between these two is really critical for you to be able to identify. Is this a talking point that they're used to saying all the time? Or do they really take the time to be able to consider the question that you're asking and giving you in, in a very genuine, authentic response that is thought through and, and, takes, and takes a great deal of consideration when it comes to being able to understand? So now let's dive into these questions. The first question that you should that you can consider asking is how do you promote diversity? Now, this question would give you a broad overview of the organizational culture around diversity. You want to take note of how each term, diversity, equity, access, and inclusion, has its own distinct definition and importance to the organization. Or take note of how what terms might be omitted in their definition and being able to understand the importance to the organization in that way as well. The second question you can ask is, can you share data on employee diversity? Now this, of course, is going to be our quantifiable evidence, right? This is what the numbers that they're able to give us to show how they put this into practice. But we're looking for true diversity. We want to make sure that they're acknowledging that diversity doesn't just refer to race and gender, but also encompasses other categories such as age, religion, military service, differently able persons, and other traits and experiences that are reflected in a company's workforce. Are they able to pull these numbers quickly? Um, are they able to give you um, solid data for this, or are they kind of guessing? Um, es estimations are fine, because they're, they're, it might be a way for them not to really know, but there is a difference between the search committee saying, um, I think we're roughly at about 12%, but we're on track to increase that number to 20% in the next five years, or, or saying, hey, I think yeah, we have that guy, what's his name over there in engineering? Both of those two things tell you a lot when it comes to diversity and inclusion within the organization. So you want to really listen to how they're answering that question. So the third question that you can ask, how do you empower your faculty and staff? And the reason why this is important is because this, these, this answer can come up in many different ways. It will show you, it can be shown in how the institutions run one-on-one -on -one meetings and evaluations, how they run department meetings, how it hands out work assignments, how it responds when faculty and staff need flexibility in their schedules, and even how it handles informal daily interactions. So just to give you a little bit of personal sharing, I used to work at a university in Georgia. And at this university, I had um, a colleague who had multiple sclerosis. And the university that hired me initially, she um, was able to have the space to be able to educate the administration on her needs and what was necessary for her to be comfortable as a faculty member on that you know, at that campus. So she was able to talk about um, the ways in which buildings need to be more accessible to her. They were very clear on what her what those moments of body fatigue might look for her and why her classes need to be shaped and need to be need to be scheduled in a particular way. We were one of the, the, the earlier universities in Georgia to actually offer the hybrid model mainly in response to her because there were days where she just physically could not get out of bed but wanted to show up for her students and she wanted to have a means to be able to do that she wanted to have a, a way to be able to still show up for her students even though her body physically was not allowing her to be able to show up to the classroom and the university supported her in that but when we consolidated because there are a lot of consolidations in georgia um and then and presently what happened in consolidation is she was seen as not being a team player 
She was seen as being combative. She was seen as someone who was not willing to adapt to a new organizational culture because they weren't willing to leave space for her to be able to be feel empowered as her position as a faculty member who also just so happened to be living with multiple sclerosis. So when you're looking for the ways in which they answer, you're trying to find and dig into whether or not these types of examples are able to come up for you and in their responses so that you can really see how they see how what it looks like to empower their faculty and their staff. A fourth question that you can ask, what groups do you feel are underrepresented and what steps are you taking to address this underrepresentation? Okay, so this is where we start to get a little deeper, right? So these questions kind of increase in intensity. So the first couple of questions seem really easy. Oh, I can ask that. I can ask that. Now we're at this point where it's like, Ugh, I'm not real sure if I can actually ask this question. But it's important because I think anyone, I think this should be a question that any candidate should ask, whether or not you find yourself in an underrepresented group or not. It's important because it really gives you a glimpse into whether or not the organization is paying attention to its own opportunities for growth and making sure that they're paying attention, that they're actually paying attention to what they can be doing in order to be able to address those opportunities for growth. And this is one of those places where being able to remember demeanor willingness and content is critical to being able to uh, be able to uh, see how they're responding to this particular question the fifth question you can ask is what programs are in place to promote inclusion now this is something that the, we're thinking in terms of affinity groups now when we're talking about universities we know that at the student level Almost every university has some type of affinity group to address students, but do they have affinity groups to support faculty and staff as well? Being able to look at whether or not the idea of affinity groups, and for those folks who might not be um, clear, affinity groups are things like women's groups, um, groups based around, say, veterans that might be faculty, or for for the Latinx population of faculty or for the, the those who identify as Black or African American, being able to look at whether or not there are groups in place so that folks have a space, not a venting session, but a safe space where they can be able to come together around issues. Once you know whether or not they have an affinity group, now you want to also know what type of voice do these groups have across the institution. Do they just kind of meet in their silos or do they do things across their groups? Are they working together in order to bring programming to the university, in order to have particular lecture series? Are they at the table for strategic planning? So when the, so if you have a group for women, for for the women deans or the, those people who identify as women who are deans, do, are they are they an intentional piece when it comes to strategic planning for the overall university? Are their voices heard when it comes time for those things, or is there a me is there a mechanism in place that's allowing these voices to be heard when considering long range planning like strategic planning for the university? So it's important to be able to know what not only whether or not they have groups and programs, but how those programs are a part of university culture. That's really critical. So the sixth question you can ask, do your employees participate in diversity training such as implicit bias or cultural competency? Now, the reason why we ask this question is not because we want to know who's doing it, who's trained, who's got the certificates. It's really trying to see whether or not the institution takes an active role in stepping up when they see issues of harassment or bias in the workplace. Are they doing what they're supposed to do in order to provide employees with tools, training, and messaging that can help support minimizing bias in the workplace that can effectively support a respectful culture? So we know we have these grand university mission statements that are that need to that have inclusive language and all of these things. This goes down to the praxis of it all. Are you making sure that what you say in your mission is being played out and is, and is being bought into by all faculty and staff that are at this institution? Are you making sure that there are things in place to ensure that what you say as your mission statement for that public face is, ha is happening behind the scenes in the classrooms, in the departments, and things of that nature? So making sure that you're able to ask that question is critical too. 
The next question that you can ask is, how would you handle a situation where a colleague was being culturally insensitive, sexist, racist, or homophobic? Okay, so this is, again, they, they get more and more intense as we go through this list of questions. And we're at question seven, and there are 10 of them, so it's getting, it's getting to that point, right? These are now questions that now we're starting to judge our own level of comfort when it comes to being able to ask these questions of a search committee. But this is what, this is what you get or what you should be able to get once you've looked at demeanor, willingness, and content in terms of their, in terms of their response. It should tell you how does the institution demonstrate a willingness to take action in these moments? Does the institution serve as a passive bystander in the event of sexist, racist, homophobic, or otherwise problematic situations? Is there a way in which they might overstep or ignore anything in their response to these particular situations? It gives you an idea as to what your day-to-day -day might look like. So again, a little bit of personal sharing. I was a professor in Georgia. The primary, um, the, for the first, say, I would say seven or eight years of my teaching, the majority of the students that I taught were white, cisgendered, male, rural students, rural conservative students. All of these things are important in terms of giving them as identifiers because it gives you an idea that there were a lot of times where in the classroom, things that could be problematic in terms of sexism and racism came up quite a bit. And I had to be sure that I was, that, that I knew that in the event if it got serious and I couldn't handle it on my own, the institution was going to back me in being able to make sure that that got shut down. Luckily for me, I was able to, I was able to have that type of support from the institution and being able to as to, you know, to ask these questions, I did ask a question similar to this. It wasn't this question exactly, but it was a question similar to this. And when I was being interviewed in 2007, in order to make sure that I was going to be protected in the event that something happens, I know that I'm a I I, I am a black girl. I'm self-identifying as a black girl from the north going to a southern school, and I'm going to be teaching, and I'm going to be in a place of authority, and it is going to be important for me to know that if, if there is a tension that arises because of my identity and the identity of the students that I'm teaching or the colleagues that I'm working with, I need to know that the institution is going to support me. So it's a difficult question to ask, but it's going to be helpful in being able to see what your support is going to look like in the event something happens. Question number eight. How would you advocate for diversity, equity, access, and inclusion with employees and stakeholders who don't understand its importance? So this is kind of digging in a little bit into whether or not they, they're thinking about the fact that everybody that is attached to the university may or may not agree with what the mission statement is. This is where you start to see that difference between those donors that give a lot of money but might not necessarily appreciate that part. How do they handle those relationships. So being able to look at diversity, equity, access, and, and inclusion as having broader meanings than most people assume. So you want to know that the institution not only grasps the true meaning of the term, but also finds merit in each of the concepts and shares a commitment to fostering them in the workplace with all stakeholders internally and externally. So you get to be able to see how do they handle that donor, that sponsor, that organization, that company that might be giving them financial support and how do they handle if there is a disconnect in terms of how that organization, that person, that it's that that body, that entity sees diversity, access and inclusion and equity and inclusion if it's different than what the university might espouse in their mission statement. So being able to ask that question is going to be helpful for you too. So question number nine, can you give me an example of how you make your employees feel a sense of inclusion, belonging, and equity on a daily basis? So now you're asking them for concrete examples. This is not just the broad affinity groups that they've heard about. This is, I need you to pull something out of your day-to-day -day working that shows how you are how you are inclusive, how you empower, and how you address some of these things. So what you're looking for of these examples of how they make others feel included in the position that you're interviewing for, the last person that was in your position, were there any were, were there any ways in which you 
feel as though you might have fallen short with being able to empower them, being able to ask, being able to dig into those questions, being able to see whether or not they can highlight a specific way that they have embraced and uplifted colleagues with different backgrounds and demonstrate how they help that person feel welcomed. So it's not just your new faculty, you're here, and then after your first year, you're kind of on your own, but how do you, how do they make sure there's a continuous feeling of being welcomed and being uplifted and embraced by the university, by the department, and then also the university as faculty come in. So then your last question is, what steps do you take to eliminate bias from your hiring process? Now, this is a tricky question because the answer may reveal that you are, in fact, their step towards eliminating bias in their process. But that's still okay because if you feel comfortable asking this question, then you can actually see how far along they are with their efforts. So if they're able to say, well, these are some of the, these are some of the things that we do in our hiring process in order to eliminate bias, or this is something that we're trying out, or when we consider the pool of applicants, you know, there, there are ethical ways that they can be able to share this information to you that's not going to overstep, that's not going to be out of order in terms of how they're able to just lay out for you the ways in which they're eliminating bias. They can tell you how the process works and to make sure that it is fair and objective for everyone and not skewing in any way in any particular person's favor. So it's important for you to be able to, if you feel comfortable, asking this question. And all of these questions are whether or not you feel comfortable doing it or not. No one is requiring that you do it, but they do. we do want to make sure that you feel comfortable with it. So there's, we're take, taking the step to ask these questions. <laughs> it can be scary. It can be uncomfortable. It is going to put us at the ultimate level of vulnerability as if the idea of hiring and the hiring process was not vulnerable enough. But what um, what I know to be true, not just from dealing on search committees, but also with just how I raise my children and how I just deal and how I deal with my mentees, is discomfort is where growth resides for everybody. So it's not just about you feeling uncomfortable so you can grow. It's you feeling uncomfortable so that the institution can also grow. If you if it turns out that you all are not a fit, you have still asked those really hard questions and had that difficult dialogue that's allowing that university to be able to be reflective after your process to be able to see if there's anything different that they can do. Your commitment to bravery in this vulnerable moment is your empowerment tool for the work environment that you deserve because in essence all of this is about what it is that you deserve for when you go into whatever institution whatever organization you want it to be how do you set it up so that you are comfortable with the ways in which you show up with the ways in which you teach with the ways in which you do your research in the ways in which you engage with your colleagues how do you make sure that that is the most comfortable to you in order for you to feel empowered in your place of employment, wherever that might be. And that's the ultimate thought that I want you all to be able to take into consideration is how do you make sure that you advocate for your own empowerment tools be, so that you can be sure that you feel the most comfortable you possibly can. So I know I went through all of those really quickly, but we do have time <laughs> to be able to just get the ball rolling and now ask questions. I'm going to stop sharing so I can be able to see the screen and also see the chat so I can see who all is here. Um, so if there's anyone that has any questions, any comments, anything of that nature that you want to share, more than happy to take those questions at this time. Um, I know, I think, I'm not well sure if you have to request to be unmuted or not in order to be able to do that. I believe um, everyone should be able to unmute themselves, but um, if you're not, uh, feel free to put up uh, your hand in the participants tab and we can do it that way. Um, so any questions, thank you, Dr. Anderson for that. Really, I mean, there was so much meat in that presentation. <laughs> and, if, and, if the question, and if the questions are, hey, can you go back to number four? Or can you show me number five again? I will absolutely do that too, because I do understand that because we are short on time, that I did kind of breeze through them in order to make sure that we can be able to have this moment of dialogue. I really do want to engage with you all. 
as best I possibly can in the amount of time that we have. So being able to allow space for that dialogue is is critical for me. So I, just, I wanted to make sure that I went through it and I went through it with haste and efficiency in order to make sure that we can have that dialogue. Yeah. All right, any questions for Dr. Anderson? Okay, well, now I'm not real sure, Kristen, is it, do you, uh, do, is this deck, do you want this deck to be available for the folks that came or? That would be great. Um, so okay. yeah, session obviously is um, being recorded, so we'll be posting this um, video in the online program in ACA Convention Central for those who weren't able to attend and want to watch it. And then we'll be posting it also on our website after the convention so people can watch it in the future as well. Right. All right, so any questions or did she just do such an excellent <laughs> you know everything we need to <laughs> It is covered. Okay, someone did check me. Um, they're really interested in looking at the PowerPoint presentation okay. following. So yeah, if you could send that to me. Oh, and I do, I do see something from Emily. Um, this is one of the slides you, you, noti you mentioned noticing missing information. I'm sorry, I don't remember which slide, but it might've been the third question, that what information we should be looking for. So there were a couple of them um, where I was talking about being able to identify that what that, min that missing information might be. So when you're thinking in terms of um, asking about the, the quantifiable data, in terms of how how de how diverse what the diversity looks like in terms of the employee pool, being able to see whether or not they give exact numbers for that, um, close estimations, or if it's just a matter of them just kind of saying, oh, well, we've got that one person that's over there. That's really important to be able to note how they respond to that. Um, being able to look at how they're able to talk very specifically about the ways in which they empower. So do they talk about how they're able to allow for a flexibility? Do they take into consideration what does it mean to be a parent? And are they flexible in that or do, are, are they unwielding? Or do they take into consideration what it means to just be a caregiver, period? It doesn't necessarily have to be a parent-child relationship. It could be a child caring for an, an, an aging parent. So being able to think about what whether or not those types of things are, are actually spoken to in their responses. Are they thinking about is the answer that they're giving you, does it sound like a talking point or does it really sound as though they have taken some thought into consideration into what it is that they're doing? Oh, I'm glad that helped you. Good, great, Emily. Thank you for your question. So which one is my favorite is the favorite to ask? My favorite question to ask really is about the whole idea of um, the how they handle sexist, racist, and homophobic situations. I like that question because that whole that's I, that's where I, I'm melodramatic. I admit I am absolutely melodramatic. I get to see that telenovela reaction because sometimes they're like oh my gosh or they might uh, they might have to pause for a second how do we answer this so being able to really um i ask that hard question in order to in order to be able to see where they are and you know i've also asked this question as someone who sat on a search committee as well because i want to be able to know that if I'm going to hire you, you're going to handle that question. So I ask it of folks who are looking to hire me, and I ask it of folks that I'm looking to hire because I want to see how they're going to respond to that. That's that that's probably my favorite question. It's probably the most controversial, but I don't back away from controversy when it comes to things like diversity, equity, access, and inclusion. So that would be probably my favorite question to ask. Thanks for that, Elaine. I appreciate the question. Okay, any other questions as we come to the end of our time today, our brief time together? <laughs> Probably some of the shortest presentations we'll have for it. We're calling this, we, I was in the Diversity Council, so we call this NCA Celebration Month. Is oh, what we're calling I like that. <laughs> Because we just got a month long, just a month long slate of all types of things. <laughs> Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. It was my pleasure to come. I enjoy talking to folks. And oh, if you want to, I will share this one. I will share this last thing with you all as well. Um, if you want to be able to have my contact information, 
I'll put this up for you all as well. It's my email, my website, and then also my social media handles, um, Black Away From Home on IG and Twitter, minus the vowels in away and from because of the character limit primarily, but those are ways in which you can contact me should you need to, should you want to reach out, ask another question or anything like that. I do like to avail myself to anyone who has questions, especially when it comes to these types of issues, because I really want us all to feel empowered when we're going into situations to make sure that we are going to absolutely be our best selves wherever we go and that people are going to appreciate our full selves when we get there. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, thank you, Dr. Anderson, again, for that really informative presentation. Uh, thank you all for um, joining us this afternoon, and we really appreciate you taking the time, Dr. Anderson.